I stood staring out the window at my life falling apart. I listened to my wife. Mock, seven years of our marriage and eleven years of our relationship. Eleven years of being a blind, stupid fool. Mary and I met in eighth grade, started dating regularly in tenth grade, and by the middle of our senior year in high school, we were already making plans for the rest of our lives. We would finish college before we got married and then settle into our careers for 10 years or so before sitting down and deciding whether or not we wanted to have kids. Mary and I parted with our virginity the night of our senior prom. Since I had a small inheritance from my grandmother, we were going to rent a small apartment and live together while we went to college. We graduated high school and then spent the summer making love at every opportunity. That fall, we started college, found an apartment, and started classes. In the middle of our first semester, I was walking out of the science building when I felt a sharp pain that was so intense it made me fall to my knees. Long story short, I had a ruptured appendix, was rushed to the hospital, underwent surgery, and then spent the rest of the year at home recovering from the surgery. By the start of the spring semester, I was back in school, and despite a huge course load, 16 to 18 hours instead of the usual 12, I was able to graduate with my class. Two months later, Mary and I were married. We both found jobs in our chosen fields, and the next seven years flew by. I thought Mary and I were the perfect couple with the perfect marriage, but apparently, I was wrong. We planned a barbecue for Saturday afternoon, and about a dozen people showed up. Mary and I spent a busy morning tidying up the backyard and getting everything ready for the guests. The guests were starting to arrive, and it looked like it was going to be a great day. Just then, the phone rang. The downside of a good promotion job is that the higher you go, the more is expected of you. Managers at my level were expected to be on call when there was a problem. Usually, six managers took turns being on call on weekends, and Andy Trent was supposed to be on call. My boss called me and informed me that there was a problem at the plant and that Andy had somehow managed to break his leg. I was next in line, so my boss needed me to jump in the saddle and ride to the rescue. When you're in my position, you don't whine, but boss, I'm in the middle of a party at home. You just get in the saddle and ride. I went and found Mary, told her what was wrong, kissed her, and told her I'd be back as soon as I could. Past history had shown that it usually takes six to eight hours to get called to duty, so I was glad I could finish everything in three hours. I hurried home to enjoy the party some more. I walked along the side of the house to the wicket that led to the backyard. As I walked down the path, I heard Mary's voice saying, Not here, Phil, I have a house full of guests. The sound came from the window of my home office. I walked over to it and looked in. The blinds were closed, but there was a gap between the bottom and the sill. As I peeked through the gap, I saw Mary standing there with Phil Evans and Marty Foster. They had unbuttoned the front of her dress, and each of them had a hand on her breasts. Come on, Mary, just a quickie. No, Phil, not now, not when my house is full of guests. Besides, Rob could come back at any moment. So what? We could F you in front of him, and he wouldn't know what was going on. That's not true, and you know it. He's not stupid, Phil. I'm just very careful not to do anything that might make him suspicious. Face it, Mary. We've slept with you all through college, in his apartment, and on his bed, and you're trying to tell us he's not blind and stupid? He loves me, and unless I do something stupid like F you here and now, he won't even suspect I'm cheating on him. Now let's go. I have to get back to the party before they miss me. When can we meet? Tucking her breasts back into her dress, she said, Rob is leaving next week for a conference in San Diego, and he'll be gone for four days. Can you guys sneak away from your wives long enough to come over and have some fun? Maybe even stay the night? I'm sure I can work something out with a week's notice, Phil said. I'll tell Joyce I'm on a two-day business trip, Marty said, and I'll spend the two days with you. Maybe you should tell the others. Sure, why not? The more people, the merrier. The three of them left the room, leaving me to stare at the ruins of my marriage. My wife had slept with two of my friends since college. Were there others? I turned and headed back to my car. 
At that moment, I wasn't in the mood to deal with any of that trio. I sat on a stool in the coffee shop and sipped my beer, watching the bartender serve a customer. Wanda was a sexy little bee, but smart at the same time. I had flirted with her from time to time over the course of a couple of years. She suddenly made it clear that she was more than willing to go beyond flirting, but I was Mr. Straight as an arrow. I was a faithful husband, and it didn't matter how often I got turned on by Wanda's delightfully round ass. I always got sex at home. Well, soon, Mr. Straight as an arrow would be free to choose other targets. Wanda brought me a new serving, set it on the counter in front of me, and said, you seem to be immersed in your own thoughts today. Are you in trouble? Serious ones, Wanda. I don't know whether I should go to the beach with you, go to Vegas, or just get a room at a convenient motel. Why not all three? That's a good point. I think I need to make a list of your weekends so I can coordinate. They owe me time off. All you have to do is tell me when. Then she retreated to the other end of the bar to serve a customer. She was just flirting, or maybe she meant it. I decided that once Mary was history, I would find out. I finished my beer and headed home. The party was still going on, although the guests had dwindled a bit. I found Mary and, trying to keep my cool, kissed her on the cheek, letting her know I was back. Then I spent the next hour or so socializing with people. The party started to wind down, and Phil came up to me. Great party. Sorry you had to miss most of it. I tried my best not to punch him in the face. Instead, I faked a smile and said, there's always the next one. When the last guest left, Mary said, leave the mess for tomorrow. Now, I need to get you into bed. You know how horny I get when I drink. Yeah, I thought to myself, and you're probably imagining it's Phil, or Marty, or one of the others. But I wasn't ready for a confrontation. I had nothing to present except that I'd overheard part of a conversation by accident. No, I needed proof, convincing proof I could show everyone so they would know what a lying horror Mary was. Proof that I could give to the wives of Phil, Marty, and the others when I found out who they were. Until then, I had to continue being the faithful, ignorant husband. I held out my hand to Mary and said, show the way, sexy. In the bedroom, we undressed, and then she came to me, hugged me, and kissed me. I stroked her breasts and wondered if she remembered that just a few hours ago, Phil and Marty had done the same thing to her. The next morning, Mary woke me up, and we made love, slowly, leisurely. Afterward, we got up, ate breakfast, and started cleaning up. Throughout the day, I racked my brain, looking for anything in the past that could have warned me that Mary was stabbing me in the back, but I never found anything. Four years of college and seven years of marriage, eleven f years, and I hadn't seen a thing. This, of course, raised the question, was I brain dead, or was I just blinded by love? Well, I wasn't blind anymore, and I started making a plan. On Monday at work, I talked to my supervisor, David. He had been divorced twice, both times because of cheating wives, so I knew he would understand. I told him I needed to excuse myself from the upcoming conference in San Diego so I could catch Mary red-handed at home. He made some suggestions and gave me the phone number of the private investigator he had used to catch his second wife. He told me I could take as much time off as I needed but that I'd have to work long hours to catch up when I returned. I went to my office and called the detective, making an appointment for the next morning. When I met with Brian Locardo, I told him my story, and he asked me what I wanted. They're planning a meeting at my house while I'm supposed to be on a business trip. I want audio and video recordings of everything they do. You know there are no penalties for adultery in this state, and it's highly unlikely you'd be able to use any recordings in court, right, he said. Maybe the courts won't see it, but a lot of other people will. He gave me a price range, and I almost choked, but then I figured it would be worth every penny if I got what I wanted out of it, revenge and payback. The next day, Brian came to the house, and after looking around, he said everything was most likely going to happen in the living room, family room, or bedroom. I asked him how long it would take to install the cameras, and he said about three hours. I gave him the key and told him I'd keep Mary busy from 10 to 2 the next day so she wouldn't catch him. 
That evening, I told Mary the first would meet a client two blocks from her office and stop by for lunch. I asked her to expect me around 11, but it might be a little earlier or later. The next day, I called her at 10.45 and told her I was on my way out. When I arrived, she was ready, and I took her to the restaurant at the Hilton Hotel. Why here, she asked as we were led to a table. You never take me to fancy places like this for lunch. You never know, honey, I said. You might want to get a room for dessert. You just adore me, don't you, she replied, smiling playfully. When you put it that way, I don't think it's such a bad idea. I think it's a great idea, I said. Why don't we skip lunch and go straight to dessert? Are you serious? I bet you are, she said, laughing, clearly enjoying the idea. I looked at her, wondering what she was thinking after handing me over her lover's leftovers. It didn't matter. What's done was done. I stood up, held out my hand to her, and said, let's go. In the elevator, I slipped my hand under her dress, and she leaned in to kiss me. Once in the room, I started undressing and said, since this is work time, we don't have time for romance. Take off your clothes and lie down on the bed. Oh, Mary asked as her dress fell to the floor, you're just going to F me, aren't you? That's right. Get your ass on the bed. Don't you even want to pull the covers off? Hell no. It's not our bed, and I'm in a hurry. So, I may double you now, am I? Isn't that what you'd call a woman who has quick sex in a hotel room? Alright, be my W for now. Come here. I drove her back to work at 10 past 3 and called Brian. He told me everything was done, and all I had to do now was get through the rest of the week. It was all going to be over by Monday or Tuesday at the latest. The rest of the week went smoothly. On Friday night, we had sex, and on Saturday, she woke me up with a kiss, made breakfast, and while I took a shower, she got dressed to go see her sister. Was she really at her sister's? Who knows? But the important thing was that I was no longer anxious to find out. I knew the truth. On Sunday, she woke me up again, and after we had sex, we had breakfast and did some chores around the house. By 11 o'clock, she started acting playful again, like she used to do before I'd leave on a trip, saying she needed a refresher until I got back. At 5 o'clock, she pulled me onto the living room couch for another quickie. I couldn't help but wonder if it was just because she was turned on by her lovers or because she knew they would be with her soon. That night in bed, she fed me hard and moaned that she hoped it would be enough to hold me until I got home. The next morning, I kissed her goodbye and set off on my trip. I checked into a motel and then drove to Brian's office. We parked the CCTV van next door to my house, waiting for Mary and her guests to arrive. At 6.10, Mary came home. We watched as she rushed upstairs, changed into a pink bustier I had never seen before, and got ready. Soon, the parade of cars began, first Phil and Marty, then Harry, and lastly, my brother Jack. They all gathered in the bedroom, and as the cameras rolled, I saw it all. My anger rose with every second. Then, I realized that I was about to get my revenge in the most satisfying way possible. As the scene unfolded in front of my eyes, I felt the fury boiling up inside me, but I kept calm. I had prepared for this moment, planned everything meticulously. It wasn't just about exposing their betrayal anymore, I wanted them to feel the weight of what they had done. The cameras caught everything, the laughter, the casual way they undressed, and the sickening ease with which my wife engaged with them all. I turned to Brian and said, we can call it a day. I think we have more than enough. Brian glanced at me, concerned. What are you going to do? I'm going to have a little fun at their expense and get revenge at the same time, I replied, voice steady, but filled with cold resolve. Brian hesitated for a moment. You don't want to tape it? In fact, I'm not even sure it's legal. Maybe it's best if you don't even involve me in whatever comes next. That way, I can honestly swear I knew nothing about it if it ever comes up. I nodded. Fair enough. I'll be careful. They're right where I need them now. I won't do anything to let them off the hook. 
After our brief exchange, I got out of the van, and as quietly as possible, I made my way to the back of the house. I had thought about this moment for days, played it over in my head. There were multiple ways I could handle it, but I was done playing the patient, unaware husband. I entered through the back door and walked straight to the basement. There, in a locked drawer, I kept my old .22 caliber pistol. I took a deep breath, loaded it, chambered around, and walked upstairs to the bedroom. My pulse was racing, but my mind was clear. This wasn't going to be a conversation. This was going to be a reckoning. I kicked the door open, and as it slammed against the wall, the room froze in shock. Mary was on her knees again, and they all looked at the door with terror in their eyes. They saw me standing there, gun in hand. Suddenly, chaos erupted. Mary, Jack, and Phil tried to scramble in different directions, while Harry and Marty fumbled to grab their clothes. I fired a shot into the floor, and everyone stopped dead in their tracks. Nobody move. I shouted, my voice shaking with fury. My brother Jack, always the arrogant one, scoffed. Be serious, Rob. You're not going to shoot anyone. He turned around to grab his pants. I shot him. The bullet hit him in the fleshy part of his thigh, and he screamed in pain as he collapsed to the floor. Before he could react further, I fired another shot, hitting him in the right buttock. Anyone else want to tell me what I will or won't do? I asked, glaring at them. The room was silent. Everyone stared at me in horror. Mary was crying, trying to cover her breasts with her hands, but I didn't care about her shame. I had given her everything, and she had repaid me by destroying our life. I came here with the intention of shooting every single one of you, but I changed my mind, I said. I think I have a much better way to get my revenge. I pointed the gun at Phil. You're going to F Mary right here, right now, for Rob the cuckold. Phil's face went pale. Rob, come on, man, do it. I barked. Meanwhile, my brother Jack was still on the floor, groaning in pain. Rob, I need to go to the hospital before I bleed out, he whimpered. You're not going anywhere until I'm done, I snarled. Maybe you should bleed to death, you miserable piece of s. At least then you wouldn't have to face your wife, mom, and dad and explain why I shot your sorry ass. Mary buried her face in the pillow, sobbing. Her sharp cries filled the room, but no one moved. Everyone was terrified, waiting for what I would command next. Okay, I said, turning back to Phil, Marty, and Harry. It's time to tell me how it all started. I know it's been going on for 11 years. I know it started back in college. What I want to hear are the details. Phil glanced at Marty and Harry before speaking, voice trembling. It happened while you were home recovering from your surgery. We were at a frat party, and she was pretty drunk. About three hours later, she came up to me and told me there was a rumor that I had a huge package. I told her it was true, and she asked to see it. I said I don't do parties, so she invited me back to your apartment. I clenched my jaw as he continued, each word feeling like a hammer striking against my heart. When we got there, she freaked out when she saw it, but said she had to try it. Afterward, she invited me in again the next day. I bragged about it to Marty, and he rolled up on her, saying he was even bigger than me, so she had to try him too. The same thing happened with Harry. She got obsessed with size, and we've been doing it ever since. I took a deep breath, my hands gripping the gun tightly. And how did my brother get involved? I know for a fact he's got a small one. Phil stammered, he came over one night when you were out of town. We were in bed with her, and he caught us. We had no choice but to take him into the group to keep him quiet. I felt the weight of their words crush me, but I was too numb to process the pain anymore. All I could think about was how to hurt them back. What are you going to do now, Rob? Phil asked, his voice barely above a whisper. It's not what I'm going to do, I said, staring coldly at him. It's what you're going to do. Then I'm going to shoot you. The room remained frozen as I outlined my twisted form of justice. I had no intention of killing them all, at least, not yet. 
What I wanted was to watch them suffer, just like I had. You better do exactly what I tell you to do, I added, pointing the gun at them one by one. Or next time, I won't aim for your leg. Phil reluctantly stood up, his face ashen, and complied with my orders. They hated every second of it, but none of them dared to defy me. When it was all over, I told them, get dressed and get out. And don't let me see you again. As they hurriedly pulled on their clothes, Harry asked, is that it? Is it over? Not quite, I replied. First, I'm going to kick Mary out. Then, I'm going to tell your wives what you've been up to. Phil's eyes widened. You can't be serious. Why destroy our marriages just because your wife wanted to have a little fun? I glared at him, rage boiling over. You were supposed to be my friends. You smiled at me and acted like my buddies while you fed my wife behind my back. Now you're going to pay for it. With that, I kicked Mary's leg to get her attention. Get your worthless ass dressed and take my brother to the hospital, I said coldly. Once you drop him off, you're not coming back here. There's nothing left for you here but pain and misery. While Mary got dressed, I made a call to Jack's wife and my parents. I told them I had just shot Jack and that Mary was taking him to the hospital. Ask them what happened when you get there, I said before hanging up. Mary asked for help carrying Jack to the car, but I laughed. Let the crawl. I don't care. When they left, I felt the weight of what had just happened settle in. The rage that had fueled me began to dissipate, leaving me with a hollow emptiness. I hadn't planned on staying in the house after everything, so I locked up and headed to my motel room. I didn't want to be there when the cops showed up, and I figured I could deal with the fallout later. As it turned out, I never had to deal with the cops. Jack, in a twisted show of loyalty, or cowardice, told them he had accidentally shot himself, sticking to the story. He might have wished he hadn't when his wife, Penny, Mom, and Dad confronted him with the videotape I'd sent them of him with Mary. As for Phil, Harry, and Marty, they didn't fare much better. Their wives found out, too. Mary became the laughingstock of the town, and after three months of trying to talk to me, she eventually gave up, quit her job, and left town. I didn't know where she went, and I didn't care. I never bothered with a divorce. Living in an affluent state meant I would have to sell the house and split the assets with Mary, pay attorney and court fees, and waste more time tracking her down. For now, I couldn't imagine wasting money on her. Maybe someday, but not now. And as for Wanda? She wasn't just flirting.